ده ده وبينار من استاذ الدكتور حلمي شراجي وهو استاذ في جامعه فيرجينيا وهو ليس اول مره يشارك معنا في مؤتمر الضغط شارك معنا في اكثر من مؤتمر الحقيقه وكفيزيكالي لكن طبعا نظم هذه الظروف فهي هيبقى آه فيرتشوال ان شاء الله و... وهو بيتطرق الى موضوع مهم جدا اللي هو السكندري هايبرتنشن كلوز اند فيو احنا في انتظار آه هو اون آه ستاند آه يعني وان شاء الله دقائق ويظهر معانا جود افترنون اتس ريلي جريت بريجر تو بي ويز يو ذس افترنون تو شير ويز يو سم اوف ماي ثوتس اباوت um secondary hypertension first i would like to thank the chairman of the session i also would like to thank the egyptian hypertension society and the organizers of this conference for the invitation to share with you some of my thoughts if time doesn't allow for questions then i invite all of you to email me all your questions and comments to the address shown here I will also show this email address again at the end of my presentation. In clinical practice, majority of hypertensive patients are treated without trying to find a cause for hypertension or what we call secondary hypertension. Thus, the prevalence of secondary forms of hypertension is markedly underestimated, although these forms can involve up to half of those with difficult to treat hypertension. The early detection of a secondary hypertension is crucial because if diagnosed in a timely manner, it can be cured and even when cure cannot be achieved, their diagnosis provides a better control of high blood pressure and allows prevention of hypertension mediated organ damage and the related cardiovascular complications. By definition, secondary hypertension includes those forms of arterial hypertension that are due to an identified etiology and therefore can be resolved by removing the underlying cause. There are too many causes for secondary hypertension. Due to time limitations, this presentation is not intended to be a comprehensive review of the topic, rather, I will provide updated concise information on the screening, diagnosis, and management of selected most common forms of secondary hypertension. There are several clinical clues for uh, secondary hypertension. Uh, first of all, because it's not cost effective to perform a complete evaluation for secondary hypertension in every patient. It's important to be aware of the clinical clues that may uh, suggest secondary hypertension. Severe or resistant hypertension is defined as the persistence of hypertension despite concurrent use of maximum doses of three antihypertensive agents from different classes, including a diuretic. So, all patients with severe or resistant hypertension should be evaluated for secondary form of hypertension. In addition, any individual who develops acute rise in blood pressure or increased difficulty in blood pressure control should be evaluated for secondary hypertension. Non-obese individuals less than 30 years of age with a negative family history of hypertension and no other risk factors should also be evaluated for secondary hypertension. The leading cause of secondary hypertension is renovascular hypertension. Its pathophysiology depends mainly on activation of the renin-angiotensin aldosterone system, or what we call RAS. RAS activation occurs when there is significant narrowing of the renal artery lumen in one or both renal arteries, usually estimated greater than 75%, or can be even at lower degree of stenosis if there is post-stenotic dilation. 
the increase in renal uh, angiotensin aldosterone system activity aims at maintaining glomerular filtration rate through induction of vasoconstriction of the post glomerular ar arterioles and via elevation of systemic blood pressure by increasing systemic arterial vasoconstriction and enhancing renal sodium reabsorption. In addition, the increase in RAS activity is associated with several systemic effects, including vascular and left ventricular hypertrophy, remodeling, release of vasoconstrictor hormones like endothelin and increase oxidative stress and inflammation. The main cause of renal vascular hypertension is atherosclerotic renal vascular disease. This slide shows CT angiography depicting moderate atherosclerotic renal vascular disease affecting the right kidney. It's most common in older adults, mainly in men with multiple risk factors. Its prevalence in general po hypertensive population ranges between one and 8%, depending on the selection of the population, but can be as high as 25 to 35% in patients with signs of multiple site atherosclerosis. The second most common form of renal vascular hypertension is due to renal vascular fibromuscular dysplasia. This disease is most frequent in young to middle-aged women. It's characterized by presence of beads like deformity of renal artery. A physician should suspect renal vascular hypertension if one or more of the following clues exist. Individuals with unexplained creatinine elevation or acute and persistent elevation in serum creatinine of at least 50% after administration of ACE inhibitor, angiotensin II receptor blockers or renin inhibitors. Individuals with moderate to severe hypertension with diffuse atherosclerosis and presence of unilateral small kidney or asymmetry in the kidney size of more than 1.5 centimeters that cannot be explained by another reason. Similarly, moderate to severe hypertension in patients with recurrent episodes of flash pulmonary edema. Onset of hypertension with blood pressure greater than 160 over 100 millimeter mercury after age 65 years. And finally, presence of systolic or diastolic abdominal proe, although this is less sensitive uh, finding. Measurements of serum electrolytes, GFR and plasma renal activity or active renal concentration uh, is the main uh, uh, part of evaluation of renal vascular hypertension. While uh, doing the evaluation, it's important to uh, uh, maximize the management of hypertension uh, with lifestyle modification, management of this lipidemia. Um, there are several ways um, also to image uh, and do imaging studies for evaluation of renal vascular hypertension. That includes uh, renal arteries duplex ultrasound with bilateral assessment of renal aortic pressure ratio. Imaging may also include CT or MR angiography and the renal catheter based contrast angiography. If blood pressure is stable with reasonable renal function and negative findings on the evaluation, then uh, 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 it's recommended to repeat assessment in three to six months to evaluate for progression of the disease. However, if blood pressure is uncontrolled and the renal function is deteriorating in a patient with high risk clinical features such, such as uh, congestive heart failure, uh, 
then uh, you may want to consider renal uh, revascularization. Um, this slide is showing left renal artery stenosis. For the catheter-based contrast angiography, it would be helpful to obtain simultaneous translational pressure gradient between the distal renal artery and the, the aorta. This measurement is used for determining the severity and hemodynamic significance of the renal artery stenosis. A pressure gradient greater than 10% of the mean aortic pressure or translation gradient of at least 20 millimeter mercury has been proposed to indicate the need to perform balloon angiography. In patients undergoing percutaneous transluminal renal angiography uh, and renal uh, angioplasty, rather, uh, for treatment of atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis, stent placement is recommended. A physician should be aware that positioning a catheter through a tight stenosis by itself creates a gradient, which can lead to an overestimation of the stenosis severity. In presence of multiple lesions, as uh, typically in fibromuscular dysplasia. Estimation of pressure gradient can be challenging. And finally, the measurement of translational pressure gradient is not widely available, even in centers that perform a substantial number of percutaneous procedures for renovascular hypertension. The second most common cause for secondary hypertension is primary aldosteronism. However, it's the most common curable form of hypertension. Primary aldosteronism is associated with higher rate of hypertension mediated organ damage and cardiovascular complications uh, as compared to essential hypertension with a similar degree of blood pressure elevation. The prevalence of primary aldosteronism ranges from 6% in general hypertensive population to more than 20% in patients with resistant hypertension. Two thirds of uh, patients with primary aldosteronism have a unilateral form of primary uh, aldosteronism due to aldosterone producing adenoma. The remaining one third uh, presents uh, with a bilateral form, what we call uh, idiopathic hyperaldosteronism, and, uh, and usually presents with uh, enlargements of both adrenal glands. Uh, there are uh, rare conditions that produce excess aldosterone production and falls under, uh, again, the diagnosis of primary aldosteronism that I will not discuss due to time limitations. Uh, such as unilateral aldosterone producing carcinomas and the familial forms of primary aldosteronism due to germline mutations, which cause uh, bilateral adrenal hyperplasia and include several types. Uh, primary aldosteronism should be suspected in the individuals presenting with severe hypertension, uh, or drug-resistant hypertension. Uh, again, hypertension with unexplained hypokalemia and metabolic al alkalosis. Uh, remember that only 30% of patients with primary aldosteronism may present with hypokalemia. In those individuals with hypertension and adrenal incidentalomas. And by definition, in adrenal incidentaloma is uh, uh, finding an adrenal uh, uh, mass uh, while working up patients for some el something else other than evaluation of uh, the adrenal cell. Hypertension also with the sleep apnea uh, uh, should prompt physician to look for primary aldosteronism. Hypertension and family history of early onset hypertension 
or cerebrovascular accidents at young age, less than uh, 40 years. Uh, presence of first degree relative with history of primary aldosterone. That is, uh, all uh, individuals with first degree relatives who had, were diagnosed with primary aldosterone, again, uh, should highlight the suspicion uh, about presence of primary aldosterone. Hypertension and atrial fibrillation. Uh, the uh, presence of atrial fibrillation is uh, very high in patients with primary aldosterone. So when you find atrial fibrillation for without a, a, an a explanation, then you may want to think about this uh, this um, uh, problem. Hypertension mediated organ damage, such as left ventricular hypertrophy, diastolic uh, dysfunction, microalbuminuria, uh, CKD, uh, that's chronic kidney disease, in excess of what expected based on blood pressure uh, values. Uh, in order to diagnose primary aldosteronism, uh, uh, Patients should undergo screening first by measurements of plasma aldosterone concentration and plasma renal activity. Plasma aldosterone concentration should be greater than uh, uh, 10 uh, nanogram per dL, while the plasma renal activity should be less than one nanogram per mL per hour, or uh, plasma renal concentration lower, uh, less than the lower limit of uh, reference. Um, if the patient fits this criteria, then uh, uh, confirmation testing is uh, recommended. However, if a spontaneous hypokalemia is present, there is no need for confirmation testing. Confirmation testing mainly are, uh, are done by uh, the most common two uh, maneuvers most of physicians prefer to do. One is uh, uh, do sodium loading, uh, high sodium diet, and measure uh, 24 hour urine uh, for aldosterone. And usually you're looking for a value greater than 12 microgram per 24 hours. The other maneuver is uh, what we call saline suppression test. Uh, that's four hour uh, saline infusion and looking for uh, aldosterone levels at the end of uh, the test uh, greater than six. Uh, if the patient fits this criteria, then the patient has uh, primary uh, aldosterone. Then the next step is to try to figure out, is it uh, unilateral adenoma or bilateral hyperplasia? Uh, the reason we uh, need to make this distinction is that uh, uh, bilateral adenoma hyperplasia is, is not the uh, cured uh, or managed by surgery, while uh, unilateral adrenal adenoma that produce aldosterone uh, is, can be successfully managed with uh, uh, surgical removal. Uh, this uh, slide is showing abdominal CT scan uh, uh, of the left adrenal adenoma. Uh, uh, pointed here with the arrow, while the uh, uh, right adrenal uh, gland uh, is perfectly normal. Now, again, as I mentioned, uh, it's very important to uh, determine the subtype uh, of uh, primary aldosteronism, whether it's aldosterone producing adenoma or bilateral adenoma hyperplasia. So the first line uh, is to, uh, of investigation uh, to make that distinction is uh, to do adrenal CT scan. Uh, usually uh, um, uh, aldosterone producing adenomas are small uh, tumors, usually uh, uh, somewhere between one to two centimeters. Uh, if the patient uh, uh, does not want to do surgery, then medical management with mineral corticoid receptor antagonists uh, is recommended. 
However, uh, ultimate cure is, is surgery, and if the patient uh, less than uh, 35 years of age, uh, then you go directly to surgery. Uh, if the patient's greater than 35 years of age, then adrenal venous sampling, the selective adrenal venous sampling to try to lateralize uh, where the aldosterone is coming from, which side, uh, right or left. And once it, it's determined, then uh, surgical removal uh, uh, and mainly uh, is done these days by lapar laparoscopic uh, adrenal electrum. Again, uh, if the uh, uh, lateralization cannot be determined, uh, then medical therapy should be pursued. Um, Phachromocytoma. Uh, it's it's a rare tumor. Uh, uh, however, uh, it's one of the curable forms of secondary hypertension. Um, it may be benign or malignant. Um, it uh, can occur uh, at any age, although uh, are most common in fourth to fifth decades of life. Uh, hereditary forms of uh, fibromyxatoma tends to be diagnosed at younger age and are also more likely to be bilateral. And uh, it's very important that all patients with adrenal incidentaloma sh should undergo biochemical screening for uh, fibromyxatoma. There are several clues uh, for presence of fibromyxatoma. Patients presents with uh, paroxysmal elevations in blood pressure. Uh, there are uh, uh, multiple symptoms, mainly the triad of headache, palpitation, and sweating are present in about 98% uh, of patients with phachromocytoma. Uh, family history of phachromocytoma uh, raised a suspicion um, uh, about the presence of this disease. Uh, some patients, especially uh, uh, younger individuals, may present with uh, catecholamine-induced cardiomyopathy. So uh, the, the, they may present with uh, heart failure, uh, frank heart failure. And interestingly, uh, uh, this uh, process or disease is reversible. Uh, also remember that uh, symptoms of phachromocytoma can range from none to many. So you really have to uh, be on alert for presence of this disease in particular in patients with uh, resistant hypertension or uh, presence of incidentaloma and hypertension. The diagnosis of uh, phachromocytoma depends mainly on biochemical evaluation. Uh, if there is a low index of suspicion in an individual with hypertension, uh, then 24-hour urine fractionated catecholamines and metanephrines is recommended. If there is a high index of suspicion, then uh, plasma uh, fractionated metanephrines should be measured. It's important to discontinue interfering medications. After biochemical, uh, uh, confirmation. Uh, the next step is uh, to evaluate with uh, imaging uh, to locate the tumor. Uh, the preferred imaging techniques, CT or MRI of the abdomen and pelvis, and usually are done first before anything else that is done. And uh, um, uh, CT or MRI detects almost all phachromocytomas because uh, most of them are uh, three centimeter or greater in diameter. It's very important to remember that once you make a diagnosis of phachromocytoma, genetic testing should be considered on all patients. There are several caveats uh, to pay attention to when dealing with phachromocytoma. Detection of plasma metanephrines must be performed under standardized conditions, uh, such as stress-free conditions and after rest in a supine position. 
with placing an indwelling catheter 20 to 30 minutes before blood sampling to avoid the pain of venipuncture that releases catecholamines and may contribute uh, to false positive results. Uh, measurements of conjugated uh, metanephrines in 24-hour urine has been demonstrated to cause false positive test results. So it's very important to make sure that uh, you order free metanephrines uh, and uh, the lab is using mass spec uh, HPLC. For 24-hour urine estimates, the use of acidified containers to achieve uh, urine pH less than four and uh, should uh, the urine uh, uh, should be stored in cold place uh, until delivered uh, to the lab. And measurements of urine creatinine is used to ensure uh, adequate collections. Imaging is recommended only when the biochemical screening is paused uh, and not vice versa. So the preferred imaging studies include adrenal uh, protocol, CT scan, uh, then MRI. Uh, the gold standard therapy for free chromocytoma is surgery. Uh, all patients who are going to have surgery should be prepared in advance with uh, giving them uh, a preoperative alpha-1 uh, receptor blockers, uh, followed if needed uh, by a beta blockade uh, and volume expansion to prevent very operative cardiovascular uh, complications. At the end, I would like to uh, give you a take home message. It's not cost effective uh, to perform a complete evaluation of secondary hypertension in every hypertensive patient. Thus, uh, physicians should consider the clinical clues that are suggestive of secondary hypertension. Would like to thank you again, and uh, hopefully uh, um, I will be able to answer all your questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Henry, for uh, the time you're taking to participate in uh, this such hypertension meeting. This is not the first time, and you not going to be the last time. Uh, share, share with me this session. Uh, Professor Ahmed Ibrahim, uh, Professor of Cardiovascular Physiology in Cairo University, and Professor Mohammed Arabi, uh, Professor of Cardiology and uh, a former uh, Chairman of the Department of Cardiology in Jewish Canal University. We have a few questions if you allow us for that, Dr. Arabi. Hi, Dr. Siragi, this is Mohammed Arabi speaking. Uh, I would like to ask you a practical question. We see these patients who have suspected secondary hypertension with no clinical or physical clues for a specific underlying etiology. And uh, I am uh, asking about a real life practical workup algorithm for these patients keeping in mind the uh, cost and the limitations in a country like Egypt. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, very important question, very practical uh, in a sense that uh, uh, everything is getting too expensive these days. Um, the most important uh, uh, finding in patients with uh, secondary hypertension is resistant hypertension. So if a patient is taking more than three different antihypertensive classes, uh, drugs, uh, including a diuretic uh, at maximum doses, then this patient should be um, screened minimally uh, for secondary hypertension. And the minimum screening is to look into uh, electrolytes, and renal function. Uh, if uh, uh, renal function obviously is uh, impaired, then this could be uh, uh, related to uh, impaired kidney function complicating the hypertensive management. Uh, electrolytes of obviously hypokalemia and alkalosis. Uh, just remember uh, that uh, only 30% of patients with primary aldosteronism present with hypokalemia. So 70% will not have any electrolyte abnormalities. Uh, 
Um, so uh, if a patient has hypokalemia, then I will go for uh, measurements of plasma renin activity and plasma aldosterone concentration. Another important issue in, in identifying secondary hypertension is symptoms. Uh, so if a patient with uh, uh, wide uh, uh, disease, atherosclerotic disease, uh, a multi-system uh, atherosclerotic disease, uh, this patient may be a good candidate for evaluation of uh, renovascular hypertension, particularly in patients in above 50 years of age. Um, for pheochromocytoma, since it's not really a common disease, uh, I go more by uh, uh, the sim symptoms clues. So for patients with headache, palpitations, sweating, uh, 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 difficult to control diabetes, for example, um, I may think about doing plasma metanephrines on those individuals. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, how widely available uh, mass spec HPLC measurements of plasma metanephrines. Uh, uh, not every lab has a facility to do this, but this is important. Uh, uh, so uh, to be more economical, I go by uh, first identifying those who are not, uh, obviously uh, non-compliance is very important issue here. Uh, uh, so we, we see a lot of patients who are, uh, looking to us as resist, having resistant hypertension. Uh, but in reality, they do not follow the treatment guidelines. So they may be skipping treatments, may be eating high salt diet. I found out also that measurements of 24 hour urine sodium excretion is a good uh, clue uh, to tell me who is not compliant because I usually give instructions for low salt diet in all patients with hypertension. So if I uh, measure urine sodium and, and it turns out to be high, then I know the patient is not following treatments. Uh, short of that, really, uh, uh, we don't have any uh, magic bullet to uh, identify uh, uh, those individuals who we can screen for secondary hypertension. Thank you very much. Any question from the floor? Uh, again, uh, uh, Professor Helmi, thank you very much. We are uh, looking forward to see you in Egypt soon, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you very much. This session is adjourned. Thank you, Abdurrahman.